at the St. Paul's Lutheran Church here at 445 on Elmwood Avenue in Providence. And we will have another beautiful worship service for you today, and we invite you to enjoy that service as you have supported us. Thank you, thank you for your constant support and your patience with all that's going on with the COVID. I know things are looking better, and we're very encouraged by that. But let's maintain, let's maintain our pace and continue to be cautious, and we will keep you informed as to what's going to happen as we are informed ourselves by the state and by the city and all of that's going on with the COVID care. So thank you for your support, especially thank you for your patience, and I hope to see you in person whenever that is possible. Sooner is always better, but we'll wait and see. Thank you.
is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 17, verses 1 through 7 and 15 through 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. God also said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her for so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Here ends the first lesson. The second lesson is taken from the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance perseverance, character, and hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. 
But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God's through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Here ends the second lesson. say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, if anyone would come up after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
We see Jesus walking along with his disciples and he asks, who do people say I am? Then he turns to the disciples, his own well-taught disciples, looks them right in the eye and he says, but who do you say I am? And Peter, of course, stands up and he says, you are the Christ. Then it says, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and three days again rise. He spoke plainly about this, but Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. And when Jesus turned, he looked at the disciples and he said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan! You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. That was a very stern rebuke, to say the least. And Jesus had to deal with Peter many times in difficult ways, in difficult situations, because Peter could stand up and he could say some of the most ridiculous things. Powerful man, Peter. A powerful man. A very powerful man. When I think of people, I, I get this picture of all sorts of different kinds of people, and what I'm thinking about today is a, an impetuous person. When I think of an impetuous person, I think of a person who is, let's see, rash, hasty, even foolhardy. When I say an impetuous person, who comes to your mind when you're dealing with people, when you're dealing with relatives or friends or employees or employers? Who's an impetuous person? Well, today I've come to the very conclusive idea that Peter was an impetuous person because he often came across terribly inconsistent in his behavior, kind of quirky, if you will. And we don't have to go far for an example because we have one right in front of us today. Peter, the powerful Peter, he stands up and he confesses, you are the Christ. Peter had a lot of training as a good Jewish boy. He knew what the Christ involved. Because Christ, from the Hebrew, would be the same word as Messiah. And let me tell you, the Jewish people knew exactly what the Messiah meant. A Savior. A Savior. To put you in a new relationship with God. 
And Peter confesses that Jesus is the Messiah. You are the Christ, he says. That means Jesus is everything that was promised in the Old Testament by God the Father. And Peter would have had that in his heart. You are the Messiah. You are the Christ, Jesus. And then within just a few short moments, Peter turns to Jesus and he rebukes Jesus and tells him, you should not go to Jerusalem. You should not be punished by the chief priests and the teachers of the law. You should not die. Everything inconsistent with what was taught about the Messiah. Everything that was inconsistent about the Christ. After following Jesus for three years now, nearly, Jesus had spoke plainly, it says, plainly about the destiny of the Messiah, the Son of Man, as he was called so often. He spoke about the terrible destiny in Jerusalem. He spoke about the cross. He spoke about his death. He spoke about his resurrection. Yet even with all of that had been taught, Peter stands up after saying, you are the Christ, and then he pulls Jesus aside and he rebukes him and he tries to stop him from doing everything that was involved with his messianic role. To be killed and after three days rise again. Peter was under the false impression, as so many were, that eventually Jesus would step up out of the crowd and become the heralded leader of the Jewish nation and he would usher in a new era for their kingdom, the kingdom of David. He was under the false impression that Jesus would take a political role and smash the Roman Empire. And then everyone would have a position of honor and a position of great prestige. Peter, I would say Peter, that was hasty, that was rash, that was foolhardy. Peter, I would say you are an impetuous person. And we could find other examples such as his denial of Jesus in the courtyard when the young girl, the servant girl, asks him, aren't you a Galilean? You speak just like Jesus. No, I do not know the man. And after the ultimate denial, he runs out of the courtyard weeping because he had denied Jesus publicly, openly, as Jesus was brought before them, standing there with that, that thorn piercing in his head, the crown of thorns. Get behind me, Satan, Jesus says, for you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Powerful, stern rebuke to a man whose confession was inconsistent with his behavior. His faith was not being exemplified by what he was saying and what he was doing. That can be called hypocrisy as well, can't it? Peter, of course, isn't the only character in the Bible and in the scriptures who demonstrates this foolhardily inconsistency between his confession and his faith, however. So Peter's kind of taken off the hook. I mean, we don't have to go far. It was the Apostle Paul. Paul lamented regularly about the very same thing in his life that he was inconsistent about his behavior. He was inconsistent about his faith. He was inconsistent about living what he was preaching. He wasn't doing what he was saying. 
and he sums that up, and I love it, from Romans chapter 7, you have it memorized practically, Romans chapter 7, verses 15 and 16, where, where Paul laments bitterly, probably holding his head down, saying, the good I want to do, I do not do. I don't understand what I'm doing. For the good that I want to do, I do not do. And the thing that I hate, that's the very thing I do. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? That's Paul. I guess we could say Paul also was an impetuous, foolhardy person. By his own admission. But then again, I pick up the scriptures and I close the scriptures. And then I think a little bit, and it doesn't take me long to realize that there are many, 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 many people who are inconsistent in their faith and what they do. Myself included. Doing things that I should not do, saying things I should not say, not having the right intentions, when my intentions are clearly wrong, or not fulfilling the right intentions that I wanted to do because I didn't do them. A wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? Because Lord God, I have been inconsistent with my faith at times. I have not always done what I have preached. And if I were out on the street, or in my car, wearing this white robe with this stole, well, I don't think you'd be very proud of me at times, as cars would cut me off, and I might say a few things, or deliver a gesture that is inappropriate. <laughs> I guess I'm pretty much a human being inconsistent with my faith, foolhardy, rash, hasty. But it makes me think, as I turn to the Lord in prayer at night, it makes me think, oh dear God, foolhardy people who are in Christ are forgiven people, aren't we? Even though we're impetuous, even though we're rash and at times foolhardy, even at times that we say things we shouldn't say, even at times we've lost our temper when we shouldn't have, we are forgiven on account of Jesus Christ. And I realize that many times, looking from the outside in, meaning people on the outside, looking inside to the church, at the people that are inside the church, many times those people point their finger at us and call us hypocrites because we're not living our faith, because we're doing things and we're saying things and we're acting really foolish and foolhardy, opposite of the way God would want us to live. And the sad, Reality, the very sad reality, is that at times they're right. We are hypocrites at times because we're not living our faith. We're not doing what we say. The good we want to do, we do not do. And the evil that we do not want to do is the first thing that we also do. Oh, wretched people that we are. But that's the church. And that's what the church is all about. The church was not meant for people of good health, as Jesus says. The church is meant for those who are sick, like a hospital. Those who have sinned and recognized their sin. For Jesus came to redeem sinners, because there is no one out there that is righteous. No one. And only their arrogance will make them point their fingers at other people and say, look how bad they are. Look at that group of people. What's the matter with them? And they don't realize that as they say that, they proverbially have the four other fingers pointing at themselves because they have fallen short so many times in the way of the Lord but don't want to admit it. We are indeed a people who need forgiveness. And that's the beauty of this story. 
We look at Peter, the impetuous, foolhardy Peter, who would say things that were just out of line, who would do things that were unacceptable, who denied Jesus in front of Jesus in the courtyard and wept bitterly, we're told. And that's the beautiful story because that's when forgiveness takes place. And that's when Peter was restored to the love of Jesus because repeatedly, 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 Jesus offers forgiveness to those who acknowledge the fact that they sometimes don't live according to their faith. O wretched people that we are. No, O blessed people that we are. For we realize that God has given us the righteousness of Jesus Christ on account of his death and his resurrection. We realize that we are at times hypocritical in our faith. But we also realize that we're forgiven. And we live in that, that unity, that disunity, whatever you want to call it. But we blend it together, saint and sinner simultaneously coming together in the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, as Martin Luther calls it, saint and sinner simultaneous. Marvelous theology it is, because I would say that God, God will save us from ourselves. <laughs> God will save us from ourselves as we struggle to put our faith into total living. And I know that that will not happen on this side of heaven, because we're human beings. But God will hold us by the power of the Holy Spirit to know that we do not fall completely from Him. Even though we fail and we fall, we are always able to be restored. And that's the beauty of Christianity. We are not hypocrites. We are saint and sinner simultaneous. And when we realize that, we come into that harmony of night where we can lay our head down on our pillow and we can say, Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Thank you for preparing a place for me in heaven. Thank you, Lord, for loving even me. Even me. Thank you. Ironically enough, it's that kind of behavior that weighs heavily on our minds. And ironically enough, it's that behavior that turns us to the Word of God. And it turns us to the vow of our baptism. And we realize that our sin was washed away at the time of baptism, and we were given a new relationship with God the Father. And we realize that we find forgiveness in the Word of God day by day by day. And we realize then as we go through these things that we are offered the complete forgiveness as we grow older in the sacrament of the altar where Jesus says, this body and blood has been given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And there, now we're talking what Christianity is all about, saint and sinner simultaneously. We're talking about a relationship in which God repeatedly <laughs> repeatedly, repeatedly, I'll repeat that one more time. God repeatedly forgives us. Isn't it wonderful? Martin Luther, I'll quote him one more time. I gotta put my glasses on to do it because I want to read it. I want to get it right. Luther says, and he says this to his congregation from the pulpit. Learn to praise Jesus Christ and despairing of yourself say, Lord Jesus, you are my righteousness just as I am your sin. You have taken upon yourself what is mine and have given to me what is yours. You have taken upon yourself what you were not and have given to me what I was not. In other words, his righteousness. You know, it may sound kind of quirky, but we 
Christians, we recognize the fact that we live in this, this strange situation where we are sinner and saint at the same time. And that is what Luther is talking about. The wonderful relationship of repeated forgiveness. And with that repeated forgiveness, once we understand that when we fall into shame, we are always allowed to be restored and return to Jesus Christ. Once we realize that that is what forgiveness means, to be restored, that's when we fully realize that foolhardy people who are in Christ are forgiven people. And forgiven people, along with St. Paul, who says, O wretched man, who will deliver me from this body of death, we can, along with St. Paul, repeatedly at night say, Thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what this is all about today. Forgiveness and restoration and being one in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of God. May God be with you always. Amen. Now, may the peace of God that passeth all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Depart in God's peace. Amen. Please join with me now in a confession of our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I now invite you to join with me in our prayer of the church. And on this day, I have several prayers here requested. And I'll begin the prayers with Victoria Ware Anderson, whose aunt passed away in Liberia. Her aunt was Mrs. Rebecca Wilson, and she was a, an educator in Liberia. So we'll have a prayer for Victoria Ware Anderson. I have a prayer also that I'm requesting for Ralph Colm, a prayer of thanksgiving for a successful pacemaker surgery, which he received earlier this month. So Ralph Colm is enjoying the recovery of that surgery. We have a prayer also for a fellow worker of the church. He's not a member, but a, a good fellow worker. His name is Gordon Chandler. He does all of the roof work for our church and has been here very faithfully. And Gordon has been hospitalized and he is suffering with heart complications and kidney failure in Roger Williams Hospital. So for Gordon Chandler, we will have a prayer. Also, this past week, we had Eunice Stoskoff was taken to the hospital, and she is now looking for recovery and asking for prayers so that she can return back home. So for Eunice Stoskoff, we'll have a prayer. Finally, we'll have a prayer for Milita Lambert, who suffered from the COVID and other complications of a minor infection, which became a little more serious than was first thought to uh, take place. So, Melita Lambert, Eunice Stoskoff, Gordon Chandler, Ralph Colm, and Victoria Ware Anderson. We bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this day for your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who gives us the ability to come to you day by day, bringing our requests, bringing our words of praise and thanks, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the improvement that we're showing here in Rhode Island and across the nation with the COVID care. Bless us as we move forward in this care, Heavenly Father, that we might receive vaccinations and then finally return back to the sanctuary so that we might enjoy a full fellowship here at St. Paul's. Thank you, Heavenly Father, what's taking place. And again, we mourn the loss of those many, many individuals 
the 500,000 number and President Biden's address to the nation, which was heartbreaking. Heavenly Father, these people were all very, very seriously involved with life, and we, we mourn the loss of these loved ones, so many, many people across the nation. Bless us as we now deal with the complications of COVID. Bless those who are currently dealing with the complications. And we ask a special prayer, Heavenly Father, that you might lift the heart of Victoria Ware Anderson, who lost her aunt, Rebecca Wilson, this past week in Liberia. Bless her, Heavenly Father. Keep her ever mindful of the open tomb, as Jesus called Lazarus, saying, Come forward, Lazarus. Come out of the tomb. That is what we look forward to on the great day of the resurrection when we will call all back from the dead. Heavenly Father, we give thanks along with Ralph Combe for the successful surgery that he underwent this past month, therefore a pacemaker surgery. Bless him in his full and complete recovery. Heavenly Father, for Gordon Chandler, we ask a prayer that he might have help and assistance for his kidney failures and for also the, the troubled heart complication that he's dealing with. Help him to deal with the recovery as he has been hospitalized. For Melita Lambert, who has returned home from the COVID care and the complications of an infection, we have a special prayer that she might have full, complete recovery and be able to walk and smile and enjoy the life that she has day by day. Likewise, we include in that same respect a prayer for Yuna Stoskov, that she too might return to her home from the hospital back to Donald and all the children that she has that take care of her. Bless her, Heavenly Father, strengthen her, and keep her ever in your good care. Look over us day by day, Lord God, and continue to watch us as we go through troubled times. Bless us, continue to give us hope, help us to focus on good and positive things, such as the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has prepared a place in heaven for us, as well as giving us this wonderful gift of life here on earth as we make our way toward heaven and see him eye to eye. Bless again, we ask always, Heavenly Father, the men and women of the service, keep them safe and sound. And bless the little children in our Banga Lutheran Training Center that they too might receive good care and a good education and also a nice warm meal day by day. Be with us, Lord God, in all of our prayers. Strengthen us as we come to you. Thank you for the address of the president this past week as he so, so tenderly addressed the nation with the care and concern and his, his understanding of sorrow and grief. Bless him as he brings us into a, into a, a more unified form of leadership and continue to bless his efforts day by day and all of those, Heavenly Father, that are involved Help them to find unity instead of reasons for divisiveness. Be with us now and always. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Please join with me now in our prayer of thanksgiving. Merciful Father, we offer the joy and thanksgiving which you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him, all our hearts and all our hearts, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Amen.
Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.